So I'm Rossi Walters on my uh, far left me, Emily Cebeda has her second book out, and last year she put out this little corner where you have a teenage protagonist who's, what's the right, what's, what's, what, how do I describe her father? Rogue scientist, mad genesist, uh, and sort of left her in a real mess, and then she's uh, living in the cabin in the woods, doing some rather uh, nasty things to survive, and then her life gets even crazier. That's about all I was saying about her. <laughs> After thinking she'd solve all the problems but one, now uh, she's back in book two and discovers that things aren't really rosy. What a surprise. <laughs> and she's sort of on the lead. Now has, I think, five books out of it. Another few coming already on the pipeline. Uh, she just won the World Fantasy Award for Jade City. Big pile of that over there, and that's well, I think it was technically the newest book, but I guess actually it's Crossfire. This is the second book in what's the series called? Uh, it's the Exo series. Exo it's series. The Exo. Starts with a young man whose father is sort of uh, the liaison between humans and aliens, and finds out that his family really has a serious political problem uh, among themselves, and he has a uh, meets a girl who's on the other side, and he has to eventually decide where his loyalty lies. And it's it's nicely complex. It's not just like you know, oh look, bad alien, good human, or Vice versa, it's a fun little thing. There's two out and one more to come. Uh, we'll see. Oh, we'll see. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this other <laughs> thing that we're not. Possibly more. Please welcome Emily and Fonda. Thanks for coming, guys. Yeah. Uh, we were here a year, it was a year ago. It was a year ago. And yeah. we were here for um, both of our books that came out yeah. this time last year. Yes. Emily had this Mortal Co Coil come out, Jade City had just come out for me, and we had yeah. a great time here. Yeah. And so when uh, this Cruel Design came out, we're like, let's do an encore. And we have two blue books this time. It was yes. red and green books last year, which was yes. nice. So we've got the, the Christmas color spectrum cover now. Um, so the way we're going to do this is I'm going to ask Emily questions for a while and she's going to ask me questions for a while and then we'll open it up for audience questions and then we'll sign some books. Yeah. Sounds good. Yeah. So uh, this Cruel Design came out yes. a couple of weeks ago and uh, you know you have now been a published author for a year so tell us a bit about the process of writing the sequel. You left this mortal coil in like this crazy cliffhanger situation, which we did again. But you, <laughs> but you left us in this like with this shocking revelation yeah. at the end of the first book. So, how did you kind of up the stakes and approach writing this cruel design? And was there anything that surprised you along the way? Sure. So, when I first uh, came up with the idea of this mortal coil. The very first idea that I had for it, and the first four chapters that I drafted, I thought it was going to be a standalone. Uh, but then I started to uncover the structure of the world, and I under undercovered some things, um, uncovered some things about the character that I wasn't expecting as an author. And then all of a sudden, it just ballooned into three books in my mind. And the first book and the second book kind of fell out pretty clearly in that moment. So I understood the big twists that were going to drive the first book would be mirrored by big twists in the second book. So this whole series, I love to be that author where I'm like, everything you think you know is wrong. Um, and so uh, with the first book, I developed a whole bunch of ideas that people thought at the beginning of the book turned out to be wrong. And then the whole idea was that they would be reversed in the second book. So in terms of actually structuring the second book, I knew where I was going. I knew what the twists were. I knew what the big plot points were. But as an author, you think you've got this outline. And then you get down to it and you realize that like, for the third act of your book, you're like, conflicts escalate. <laughs> and in your head, that's a plot. But then you go to write it and you're like, oh no, what actually happens on the page? Um, and with the first book, I spent five years writing this moral coil. So I had a long time to figure it out and get it right. And then I had a year to write Cruel Design. And that was a year in which I was promoting the first book. Um, I was being a published author for the first time, which takes up time in ways that you don't No, it takes expect. up so much time. <laughs> it does. <laughs> and it takes up brain space as well. Like, I'd had critique partners before that. So I'd had people read my writing, and I had feedback groups. And I'm quite comfortable with critique. I'm the kind of person where 
you know, the more harsh somebody's critique is, if it's helpful, the more I want it because I know they're trying to help me publish my work. I know they're trying to help make it better. Um, but what I wasn't expecting is just the feedback from readers. I'd never been exposed to that before where it's not critique, it's not intended to enhance the work or, or really critically comment on the work. It's just like, I love this and I love this and I love this character, which is so exciting as a writer, but at the same time, um, both the good and the bad sit in your head and you say, well, readers love this, so I should do this. And readers didn't like this so much, so I shouldn't do that. Um, which is fun, and I think responding to it for some amount is really helpful as a writer. Um, hearing what readers do and don't like can be really helpful. But also, it's a change to your creative process, and any change in your creative process um, can take a long time to absorb. Yeah, and yeah. even the good noise is still noise. It's still noise. Because you no longer have just you're not alone with your creative process anymore. Yeah. Now there's people who are asking you how you're doing on Twitter. And That's when's right. the next book gonna come out? Yeah. And so there's you know, a, still a lot of that. And, and also yeah. you have just the, the pressure of wanting the second book to live up to the first book. That was a big one for me. Yeah, so um, I didn't realize, so I kind of thought that I was like this typical genre thriller writer where I was writing you know, pacey, end of chapter cliffhangers, fast books with great science in there, um, thrillers, edge of your seat. I knew I was doing that, but I didn't think my writing was really anything, anything special. You know, I just thought it was effective writing to get you from A to B fast. Um, but then readers started, you know, highlighting quotes from the book and creating aesthetic graphics of quotes from the book. And I was like, oh, that line is nice. <laughs> <laughs> and then you look at your draft of book two and your, your draft of your next book is always just a steaming pile of nonsense. And you're like, where are your good lines? <laughs> like, <laughs> I don't have any people who are gonna think I've forgotten how to write, so. <laughs> well, I have finished this cruel design so I can I can very confidently assure the audience that it lives <laughs> up to the first book. Thank you. <laughs> and um, you know, one of the things that I, I remember when I first heard about this mm -hmm. Mortal Coil, um, the thing that that was immediately like a sell for me was you were like, oh yeah, and that cover is an exploding human. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and yes. Uh, and I and then you went on to describe this horrible plague, which makes yeah. people explode, which is just diabolical and. Um, it, and I noticed, you know, at, at, as, as I read both of the next two books, mm -hmm. there's so much of it that's really very body horror-ish. I mean, there's yeah. like, you know, wires bursting out of people's arms, yes. there's sockets in the brain, there's the exploding humans. So where does this come from? What kind of, you know, <laughs> are you a fan of body horror? Did this like, well, where, where, yes, tell yeah, me. Yeah, see, I'm not. Like, if there is a scene on, I mean, on a movie or on a TV show where there is body horror, I've got my face in the pillow. Like, I'm turned around, I'm hiding, I'm telling my husband to tell me when it's over. I can't handle it, and needles especially. Like, they love needle scenes in movies. Why can we ban them? I don't understand, but I will put them in my work. Like, yes, you will. You do. I don't really understand. I think it's partly, um, so like a lot of the scenes in the book tie into my own fears of it. So me trying to understand what it is about body horror that scares me. And what is it that's scary? Like people get injured all the time. Um, why is it scary? Let's write a big long scene and see if we can find out. Um, and I think s some amount of it is just almost like a Chekhov's gun in my mind. So like if there's tech inside someone's body, it has to come out. Like <laughs> it's like what goes up must come down. What goes in must come out. Um, <laughs> explosively, ideally. Um, yeah, I don't know, I, I, I really enjoy those scenes. I didn't realize how violent they were until my agent and my editors were like, this is, uh, this scene, this scene made me woozy. And I'm like, really? Wow. <laughs> and they're like, make it worse. Make it worse. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah.
Yeah. So one of the um, themes that's very prevalent in science fiction is this idea of transhumanism. Yes. Right? That somehow we will move beyond the constraints of our current yes. physical and mental state. And you often see this with stories about artificial intelligence mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. you know, altered carbon where humans are downloading themselves yeah. into new sleeves and things like that. So transhumanism is clearly a huge part of, um, of this work. mortal. Yeah. yeah. Of, uh, mm -hmm. this mortal coil as well. And um, one of the really cool philosophical debates that is in this cruel design mm -hmm. is between these different factions of yeah. people. The ones who you describe as craftists who mm -hmm. believe that like the human body is the product of millions of years of evolution and we should not muck around with it too much. Like, yeah, yeah let's use genetic technology to fix inheritable diseases, but let's not go crazy here. Yeah. And then you've got the people who have gone total, you know, rogue open source, like let's take this tech and just use the human body as a starting point yeah. and have our bodies covered with scales or yeah. pre have a prehensile tail or wings. Yeah. So it was, that is a really interesting kind of moral underpinning that goes through mm -hmm. the book. And I'm curious about where you come down Where on do this. I stand? I. I think I'm kind of in the middle. So I agree that we've been around for a long time and our current form as it stands is fairly robust. Um, in modern society, we don't really even know how robust the human body is, but it can go a long time without food. It's very resistant to a lot of diseases. Like we have a fairly well-functioning body here. Um, and it's it, it is that way because it, we've been evolving for so long. But on the other hand, a lot of, if you look at any individual aspects of the human body, you're just gonna find a lot of nonsense. So I love to talk about our eyes. So our eyes uh, evolved when we were underwater. And that's why they're full of fluid because the fluid was matching the refractive index of the water. Uh, and so if we'd evolved on land, our eyes wouldn't be these wet things that can burst. <laughs> um, they wouldn't be full of fluid. They wouldn't work in the same way. The lenses would be hard. They'd be different. Um, and they could be much, much better than they are now because the eye had to go through this huge evolutionary process to just adapt to being on land when it could have been instead focused on being a better eye and seeing better. So I think when you look at any part of the human body on its own, you, there's room for improvement. But when you look at it as a whole, it's probably pretty, it's a pretty good, it's doing a pretty good job at getting us around. Um, yeah, I don't know, but I, I do like the idea of, of completely changing everything as well. Like, what yeah. if we could have more brains, you know? <laughs> <laughs> There's some, some and, and what's great about the story is that you have the characters on both sides. Yes. And um, they're not, and it's not like a black and white, you yeah. know, evil side versus good side. I mean, there's clearly people who have, you know, very strong reasons mm -hmm. to believe on, on both sides yeah. of um, both your, like, I mean, even who's the antagonist and the protagonist yeah. constantly shifts because of all these plot twists that you throw yeah. in there as well. Um, so another question I have for you is um, around this idea of, uh, of identity, mm -hmm. because that's a huge theme in your books. Yes. And as I was reading it, um, I was reminded of this movie called Dark City. Have right. you seen it? I haven't. Has, but anyone else, has anyone in the audience seen it? Yeah. Great movie. Is it um, sorry? Is it Australian? No, I don't believe so. It's like a science fiction movie from years back. But it's this somewhat underrated science fiction film. Um, but it, it, it really, it, the idea behind it is um, that there is this sort of almost this, this, uh, this place where mm -hmm. every night it gets reset. And there's like these creepy people who are sort of other beings who, who engineer it. But um, they reset people with different memories. So mm -hmm. the idea being, if you, if you woke up with Ooh. the memories of a killer, yeah. would you then go on and yeah. kill because you believe you have done it before? And how much of our nature is built in because of what we believe or yeah. our identity? Yeah. So um, how did that theme kind of filter through your books? Was it like a deliberate thing that you wanted to explore mm -hmm. or did it just kind of bubble up in the process of this character that you created? I think it was a bit of both. So I think as soon as I started looking at Gentech at genetic engineering because 
uh, I wanted to deal with the virus. And I wanted to deal with the virus because I wanted to create this post-apocalyptic post -apocalyptic landscape. And that was the only way I could think to do it, was to have this virus. But I just wasn't excited by the idea of somebody kind of running around injecting people or making a vaccine in a lab. And at the same time, I was reading about CRISPR um, and about genetic editing and the, the, you know, the genetic editing that's happening today, like it's actually starting to happen. And I just thought the, the future of genetic editing is going to be algorithmic. So we're going to end up uh, with people creating algorithms to affect DNA. So that's where Gentech was born. But as soon as I had that idea, and as soon as I merged that with my idea of my main character, uh, the questions of identity just came from there. It was basically, so if we can change our DNA, then, then what does that mean for us? What does that, is there a core of us that doesn't change? And so the first book, This Mortal Coil, is uh, an exploration of the th all the themes of the human body, basically. So we take the human body and we destroy it. We detonate it into a cloud of infectious mist. Um, we <laughs> destroy its sacredness by making human flesh the only um, immunity that you can get for this virus, which if you haven't read the book, spoiler alert, cannibalism. Uh, not really a spoiler, it's in the first chapter. Um, <laughs> We l open up the human body physically and take a look inside, um, and we rewrite the human body and, and look at what happens to identity there. So this mortal coil is really a book about the human body and how much we can change it and what we can do with it and why is it still the human body? What does that mean? And this cruel design is about the mind. So we go from the body to the mind. And this cruel design is looking at how can we take genetic engineering? How can we take gen tech? How can we take these integrated tech that people use in this world as well? So it's, they're not just changing their genes, they're growing circuits around their optic nerves. You know, they're, they're altering their bodies in different ways. Um, how does this tech change our minds? And what if you took someone who didn't really care how they looked, so they didn't really want to change their DNA, but they wanted to get smarter in any way they could, what would that person look like and what would they do? Um, and what does that mean for their identity? Are they still human? Are they still the same person? Um, that book, this core design, is really looking at answering that question a bit. I, you know, I could have written these philosophical novels, but instead I just want things to blow up the whole time and the characters <laughs> to be <laughs> running and screaming. So we get little questions every now and again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so one of the, so in this cruel design, you have a number of new characters, mm -hmm. um, and they include characters who are really give Cat a run for her money. Like she really meets her match. Yes. And um, you know, not to spoil it for anyone who hasn't read it yet, mm -hmm. um, but you know, there there a number of the new characters motto this like mm -hmm. this this hacker who's better than she is. Yes. Who, you know, um, Regina, mm -hmm. this leader of this commune. Who's better. Who's, and, yeah. Yep, yeah, and, uh, and Anna, the, another of the um, kick-ass. Yeah, um, Zarathustra yeah, kids. Yeah, blackout agents. So, who's your favorite new character? Favorite new character? Um, I'd have to say Mato. Mm -hmm. So, Mato is just, um, just a fun character. So Mato is a character who has said, how can I make myself smarter? What does that look like? How can I become more powerful by using tech? Uh, and that for me is, you know, when, it, when, it, when you're facing something like a virus, that can be a very noble goal to become more powerful and smart because you're trying to save the world. You're trying to engineer a solution. I <laughs> like he's, he's a very <laughs> scary character, honestly. I'm going to trade my that. humanity for a solution for everyone. Um, but at the same time, it's, it's also very terrifying. So I really enjoyed um, taking that character to, to where they could go. Mm -hmm. Well, I could ask you a ton more questions. Yes. But I'll ask you one last one, which sure. is, what can you tell us about book three? Not much. Uh, these books are really made of spoilers. Um, I can tell you that we will meet the fifth of the Zarathustra subjects. Um, I can tell you 
there'll be more pigeons. Um, <laughs> Uh, oh, look, that's about it. The, the, it's, it's towers <laughs> of spoiler upon spoiler. Yeah. Yeah. But I want to ask you some questions right. about Crossfire and EXO. So when I heard you speak when Jade City had launched, um, and congrats again on the World Fantasy Thank Award. You. That is huge. That's amazing. Um, you had published three books with three different worlds. Mm -hmm. So you had done world building for three different series. And if anybody here has ever written sci-fi or fantasy, then you know that the world building is half of the task. Um, so I wanted to ask a little bit about your world building process. So do you start with a core of an idea and add to it? Or does it kind of come to you whole? And also, I know for myself, sometimes I'll discover something about world building as I'm writing and then have to go back to the beginning. Does yeah. that happen to you too? How does it, how does yeah. it happen? Yeah, so um, I'm a world building junkie. Yes. I just, I love it. But I'm also, um, I, I'm also not someone who wants to get so lost in the weeds of world building that I never publish novels because mm -hmm. I have a publication schedule to, to stick to. So I, I start with what is, um, what's kind of, the world and in, in the sense of what's important about this world that will drive the narrative. Mm -hmm. And each of my books have, has come to me in different ways. Mm -hmm. um, so Zero Boxer came to be very much, um, the, the plot was the thing that mm -hmm. hooked me in. Mm -hmm. um, I had this idea that it would be a sports story in space and I had, I, I knew what the like the twists in that story would be. Um, Exo and Crossfire came to me as a character. So Donovan mm -hmm. was the first thing that came to me. Mm -hmm. um, and. I knew that he would be this character that was in this really compromised position um, and, and wouldn't be kind of your typical teenage rebel fighting the aliens, but mm -hmm. would be kind of part of, of that occupation and, the, and, he, and he would have this cool alien tech in him. So once I like figured that out, um, I, the world kind of built around the needs of, mm -hmm. of the stories that started to grow. And then Jade City, it was the world that came to me first. Right. Um, in a notebook that I have dating back years, I have a note in there that is just, it's just Jade City. That's the title. The title actually came to me along with the world. Wow. And it was Jade City, and then I think I wrote um, Wuxia Gangster Fantasy and a world where uh, ha combat is hand, hand, but how power rests with those who have magic jade, or something like that. And that was it. All I had was three lines in a notebook, and it stayed there for a year until I, I fleshed it out. But the, mm -hmm. the, but that world came to me first, and then I had to find the characters. Yeah. So each each world building exercise has been different because they've all started in different places, depending on where the story seed it, uh, came from. I love to create worlds that feel very lived in, mm -hmm. that feel really mm -hmm. real. Um, I, I want to make you feel as if this place could really exist. They do. And, yeah. and whether that is some futuristic uh, alien city in like Wyoming, mm -hmm. or whether it's a secondary world Asian metropolis, I want it to feel like you could walk the streets, you could touch the buildings, like all that stuff. Um, so I, I, uh, I kind of build out from um, what the storyline is, and I just keep layering. I, and world building is one of those things that people think you you do, and then you write the mm. book, but you really don't. You you do some of it up front, but it's an iterative process that you continue to do as the writing progresses. In the same way that the characters develop and the plot develops, the world develops too. Do you keep so some writers keep like an uh, encyclopedia kind of so they keep a folder of notes just for their world building? Do you do that at all, or do you do you just keep it in your mind? I keep I do keep it in a, a variety of labeled Scrivener folders, right. and also notes in my notebook. Um, and I fortunately my copy editor is very good at like doing having a style guide that's got all my characters and the names of the places that I've um, mentioned in the novels and things like that. So uh, so yes, I do organize it, but a lot of it is is in the head. Yeah. Um, I would love if one day someone just like built a fan wiki and like put all my stuff that in there and then nice. I could refer to it. That would be awesome. Yes. But yeah, a lot of it is, is 
Yeah. And, and the Scrivener is a great thing to just put all of it in there. So one of the things that I'm so jealous about with all of your books is that you have these badass core ideas and they, they're so easy to pitch. So I pitch your books all the time and I'm like, <laughs> you've got Asian Godfather with magic and Kung Fu. And everybody is just like, well, I'm sold. I have to buy that, you know? <laughs> and aliens have invaded the earth and they won and it's over. And let's look at what happens after that. And people are like, I, I feel like I haven't seen that before. They're just, and then obviously, zero gravity boxing in space. Like, come on. They're these amazing ideas and they're so easy to pitch. And like, I just wanted to ask, are you someone who comes up with hundreds of ideas and then finds the most badass of them? Or is it more that you come across ideas and wait for something to, to tweak for you. Yeah. How do you get these amazing ideas? <laughs> so I write the ideas that won't go away. Right. So, right, there's always, as a writer, you get all these ideas, you just walk around and, I don't know, you're doing the dishes mm -hmm. or in the shower and you come up with some idea or you wake up from a dream and you're like, oh, that's a cool idea. But most of the time it's gone by like 10 o'clock in the morning. Yes. Um, but I, I tend to give my ideas time mm -hmm. to age a little. So um, the, the works I tackle are the ones that like, have taken up residence in my brain and yeah. won't really go away. I do have an idea file, and oh. I will go in and I'll update it and put in some, some things, and, um, and once in a while I'll revisit it. But at any given time, I have about two or three big ideas that are sitting mm -hmm. in my brain that have kind of moved in. And then I know that those are the ones I, mm -hmm. I want to write. I also... Um, I, I tell this to aspiring writers a lot. You know, write the ideas that make you pee a little in excitement. And that's like, that's kind of like how I feel. Like for me, Zero Boxer was that idea. It was like, I, like prize fighting in zero gravity, that I have to write that. I can't yeah. not write that. Yeah. And, you know, the same thing, it was the same with, um, you know, with, uh, with, um, you know, Jade City, where I was like, okay, Godfather with Kung Fu and magic, okay, that I, no one else is going to write this that I, mm -hmm. I and so you write the books that you, that you want to read. Yeah. Um, and I also try to like, as I, I feel like it's helpful for me as a writer to have a really clear idea of what I want the book to be at the end mm -hmm. before I start writing. So if I can create that pitch in my own brain, it yeah. helps me grasp onto that idea even if the book takes me two years or three years to write right. I, if I that's like my north star and then yeah. it ends up being something that my agent can use which is very convenient yeah <laughs> um yeah easily pitching a book like that is so rare and so important um and something else that's rare that you do uh is that you build you don't only build worlds that have science that feel gritty that feel real but you explore interesting power structures in all of your worlds. So we've got power structures of magic and family, uh, and that's a really interesting power structure. You've got power structure in Zero Boxer of uh, the, the governments, but I think really the media, I think, was a really interesting power structure that you explored there. And in the EXO series, you've got this fascinating power structure. Um, so you've got the Shri government, and you've got their liaisons and the human government that's dealing with them. Um, and I, it makes me think about your background, so you've worked in corporate strategy, so you've thought a lot about power structures and communications of power. Um, what is it about these interesting power structures that brings you back to them? I just feel like it gives stories more depth and more angles to explore. Because mm -hmm. oftentimes I find fantasy and science fiction can be seen as escapist mm -hmm. and can, you know, you, you kind of imagine people who don't know the genre very well might think, oh, it's always, you know, like light magic versus dark magic or, you know, the evil empire versus the rebellion. Good and, and bad. That sort of, yeah, good and bad mm -hmm. stories find their way into mm -hmm. our genre a lot. Um, but I I love to write uh, fiction that feels very much 
like it's our world. Mm -hmm. And nothing, no power structure is simplistic, no. right? So um, I loved the fact, I loved playing with the, with the Exo series, the fact that within this this occupying alien force within the Zri, there are divisions, mm -hmm. right? There are the Zri who are born on Earth and think of themselves as Earth Zri, yeah. and those that you know are from the home world and see these the colonial Zri as being you know these backwards colonials, and then there's you know th then there's another alien power, the Ri, who are you know coming in. So there's there's that creates this complexity because there's no simple solution. There's yeah. no way in which something can be really neatly tied up with a bow at the end. And, and I also love the fact that um, the stories can be used as a way to have discussions, um, especially since with the EXO series, I was writing for you know, a, a, a teenage audience. Mm -hmm. And so and I got a um, recently an email from a teacher in Manitoba who said, I'm teaching a, um, a, a class, a, a middle school social studies class, and we are discussing um, the rights of like First Nations. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm using your, I'm also doing a read aloud in my class, and like using your book as a way to talk about That's like awesome. rights of Indigenous people and like yeah. what's happened in Canada's past, which was super cool. So yeah. he had me like Skype in for 15 minutes. So I love. Um, the idea that I can bring something that's escapist fun to a teen mm -hmm. that also makes them think about some yeah. of the things that go on in our world. It can be easier to think about these things sideways. Right. Yeah, yeah. And you never provide easy answers. So you were talking about the there is no good or bad with the genetic uh, engineering viewpoints in my books. You never provide good or bad in your books either. You love to walk in the morally gray zone. I do. And that's something that I found just gripped me with Exxon Crossfire. Um, Donovan has no easy answers. Um, Donovan exists between worlds. Uh, and every time you show us something terrible that's happening, um, we're given, we, we understand the reasons that it's happening and, and, um, and yeah, you, you bring us in these intensely deep and uncomfortable places. Can you tell me about why so you I, do that? So I think, you know, one of the things uh, that makes characters feel very real mm -hmm. and not just like fictional mm -hmm. set pieces is this idea of status. Yeah. And I, I was teaching a writing workshop yesterday here in Seattle. And um, I was describing this to a group of aspiring writers, which is if you have a character who feels flat, mm -hmm. often they feel flat because they are always the same way. So if they are, let's say, a, a, you know, an overbearing, badass you know, soldier, mm -hmm. what have you, you know, if, if that character is that way through the whole book, mm -hmm. that's what makes them feel two-dimensional. Um, characters feel real when they... When, they have they relate to other characters differently and mm -hmm. you know the way that you we you know relate to our parents is different than the way we relate to our children which is different than the way we relate to coworkers and so um, characters feel more real when they are placed in different situations some of which we, where they have higher status and some where they have lower status mm -hmm. so donovan um, is a great i love donovan as a character cuz he's always trying to do the right thing even yeah. though he's not sure what that is and in some ways, he's a privileged character because mm -hmm. he has these privileges that other humans do not have. Mm -hmm. But he's privileged for a human. Yeah. And that he still has to fight against the, over the overall power structure of his planet, where humans are the underprivileged. Mm -hmm. and, and then he has these complicated issues with his parents. And he, will, you know, he always has this, this thing going on with his father um, that puts you know, I'm in a different sort of status position versus he's got the camaraderie of his mm -hmm. uh, of his um, fellow exos. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, so I I like that. I like putting I like creating characters that are really stuck between a heart a rock and a hard place all the time, <laughs> and it's just great. Fun. Yes, yes. Um, so, I also loved Donovan's camaraderie. That that was something that the camaraderie of him with his fellow exos um, that just really sang off the pages for me. And, and it felt um, like you could feel the young adult 
feelings coming from the book so strongly. So it's, it is a book for teens. I enjoyed it as an adult. I think a lot of adults do, but I think it's got a really authentic young adult voice. And whenever I read that, I always wonder about what the author was like as a teen and if they were drawing on their own teen memories. Um, so I realized I'd never asked you, we've done many events together. Tell me about Teen Fonda. <laughs> oh. So Teen Fonda was um, a nerdy overachiever. Right, yes. Yeah. Not so, surprised. Not surprised, <laughs> yeah. No, I was uh, captain of the debate team. Yes. Yes, that level yes. of nerdy overachiever. Um, yeah. Uh, what else did I do? Like Model UN and Science Fair, and I was yeah. valedictorian and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. I can see that. I can see that. So where does where does all the punching come from? <laughs> <laughs> so on top of that, I was I've been training in martial arts since I was a teenager. I took it up in my yeah. teens, mm -hmm. um, and that's kind of been one of the uh, spines. One of the things that's that's always been present in my life, along with writing. Yeah. So. Every book of mine has to have punching in oh, some, yeah. <laughs> some form or fashion. But some of the best fight scenes you will ever read because Fonda knows what she's talking about. To me, writing fight scenes is candy, right? Yeah. There's so much other stuff that's hard to yeah. write, like, you know, tense emotional maneuvering and the mm -hmm. politics and, um, you know, heavy dialogue scenes and world building. And so when I get to a scene, a fight scene, to me, that's the candy. And it's, uh, I've, I know some other writers who are like, oh, fight scenes are so hard, but because, um, because I look forward to them, I can be like, okay, I, once I get through this chapter, I know there's a fight scene coming up. Yeah. So not only have you navigated releasing YA novels and adult novels and done so spectacularly, can I say, um, but you've navigated publishing in sci-fi and in fantasy. Now, I know you love both genres. You're excellent in both genres. Um, but let's say you're only allowed to write one. <laughs> so cruel. So cruel. <laughs> For the rest of your career, is it sci-fi or is it fantasy, and why? You know, I'm going to have to say science fiction. Mm -hmm. if I have to choose one. Right I answer. <laughs> um, and I would say because even my fantasy mm -hmm. Uh, feels science fictional yeah. Yeah. in the sense that it feels like they're the magic in my fantasy worlds feels more like a resource mm -hmm. you know a technology that is available to certain people and there's questions in that society about how it should be used who has mm -hmm. access to it etc um, and uh, and I've, I've actually had readers comment that like Jade City feels more like a, it's a low, it is a low magic world and it mm -hmm. has kind of more of a science fictional um, tone to it maybe mm -hmm. than a lot of what you think of sword and sorcery, high fantasy, that mm -hmm. sort of thing. Um, so, so yeah, I, th I think my natural authorial voice is, is more science fictional in nature and, um, you know, and I have, plus I have science fiction ideas in my brain right now. So if <laughs> no, yeah, how many ideas do you have in this ideas folder that you speak <laughs> no. up? <laughs> you know, I mean, at any given time, there's probably like five to ten ideas yeah. in this file, but like maybe one or two that are really sort of burning yeah, ideas. Sure. Yeah, um, but uh, no, no, again, there's another fantasy idea. Okay, no, that would be hard. Yeah, no, but I stick by my original. <laughs> Can't change my mind now. Sounds good. Wait, this is being recorded. Yeah, so this is. This is like, it's a I'm not going to be able to change this. I know. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you, you're wrapping up edits on Jade War. Yeah. Yeah. And you're probably not thinking about anything else right now. But is there something else that's grabbing, grabbing hold of you right now? Is there anything you can tell us about what you want to work on next? Oh, well, I have to write the rest of the Greenbone Saga trilogy, yes. which is going to mm -hmm. take up a good chunk of the next few years of my life. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the primary thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I would love to write a space opera. I have an idea for a space opera um, that I would like to write. Yeah. And I have a 
a sci-fi thriller, kind of like in the vein of a, of a techno thriller Ooh. in my mind. So that's what I'll probably tackle next. Um, and I will, we'll see how this goes, but I would like to continue writing both young adult mm -hmm. and adult fiction, um, but we'll sort of see, yeah, yeah we'll sort of see how, how it shapes out. Yeah, sounds great. All right. Does Should we do some questions from the yeah. audience? Somebody must have some. Yes. Does anyone have questions for us? Do either of you have soundtracks you write to? And what are they? I find it, I can't write to anything with a voice in it. So something in my brain, if I hear words, I can't write words. Um, and so some classical music I can, but I even find that there's a narrative in the notes themselves that I get caught up in. So I tend to listen to white noise um, and rainforest sounds and um, like whale sounds and stuff. Your typical relaxation noise is the only thing that I can listen to that drowns everything else out but allows me to continue to have my internal monologue going. Yeah, yeah I'm the same way. I tend to just want silence. But every once in a while I will put on some ambient noise, whether it's rain, or sometimes I will try and get some ambient noise that fits with the tone of what I'm working on. So there's, um, there's been times when I've been working on, most recently, Jade War, and I've gotten some ambient noise that's kind of like restaurant background noise, um, or you know street noise, to try and like put myself, imagine myself in, in the setting, and that might like spur the uh, the creative juices a little bit, but um, otherwise, yeah, same thing, no, no songs. I'll have a song as inspiration sometimes, sometimes, yeah, but I won't be able to listen to it while I'm actually writing. I have to kind of stop and listen to it and get all pumped up and then... What are the power-up songs? Oh, um, I'm really into this band called Coheed and Cambria, um, and they have a whole bunch of songs that just get me thinking. They're science fiction alternative rock. Yeah. <laughs> Coheed and Cambria. Yeah, everyone's writing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, their albums are literally following like a science fiction epic. Okay, I'm yeah. gonna have to pick your book later. <laughs> yeah. Um, what do you have to say about research and like, I thought one of the writing process you do both research and research and then research and Yeah, research is a big part of it. I do a whole ton of research before I start writing, and then I will continue to do research during the writing process. Um, but there's a, there's a fine line with research. You have to do enough, but you also don't want to get derailed um, while you're writing. So I'll, I'll do enough to feel very confident about the world that I've built and what I need to know to start writing, and then as I'm Moving through, there's times when I'm like, okay, I have to stop to do some research because this affects the story. And then there's times when it's like, okay, that's a minor thing, but it doesn't affect the story. Make a little note to myself, I have to research this later, later and I'll keep writing. I tend to do research as I go. Um, with most of my books, um, they're actually just cobbled together from things that I've picked up. Uh, over the course of years, like headlines that have caught my attention. It'll often start with just the germ of an idea. Um, and then I'll just start writing and realize that I need to come up with um, a particular chemical or something I need to use. And then that will spawn a, a Google session, which is very dangerous because those Google sessions can go for four hours and end up with nothing to show for them at the end. Um, so I tend to do sporadic research as it's called for. Um, I have thought about doing research at the beginning and I think that could be more fruitful because then it would, like it would, I wouldn't have to do so much of it later on and I might discover more interesting things, yeah, but it tends to be just Google searches as I'm going for me, yeah. You know, people change over time. Do your characters change over time? And what happens when they change it? I think they have to change. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, there's no arc for them to follow. Mm -hmm. So I think characters have to change, but I, we do as writers as well. I think when I think about my original plans for my series, I don't think 
I've thought about some of the internal changes that my characters might need to change. And, and as I've become a better writer, as I've learned more about character and story, um, I've started to dig more deeply into what various things mean to my characters and how I, how I should explore them. Um, but yeah, I think, I think characters do definitely need to seriously change. And that's what every story is. Every story is, is um, the process of a character undergoing change. Yeah. I think of characters as much as I can, like real people, mm -hmm. right? There's those that undergo some serious life-changing events. Um, there are others that resist change. There are others that change and then backslide. There, you know, I, I think there's infinite variations of how human beings go through this journey that is our life. And um, I want my characters to feel as real as possible. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, they, they absolutely do change as a result of the things that happen to them in the story. And it's that interplay between the plot and the character that creates what, that narrative engagement. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, you don't have a story. You just have a bunch of events that happen. Because the events aren't what's important. Mm -hmm. um, what's important is how those events affect the character mm -hmm. and how that then leads to new events. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that, that is, that's the art of storytelling. That's what's mm -hmm. exciting about what we do. What's the coolest bit of world building you had to leave on the cutting room floor because you couldn't fit it into plot? <laughs> okay, so, uh, it, so because I write both young adult fiction and adult fiction, um, I have two editors. And uh, it's, uh, it's interesting to me because um, with the, uh, I approach writing both categories very similarly. I put the same amount of work into the world building and the ideas and the development of the story and so on. Um, with my uh, adult editor, often I'll do some world building and my adult editor will be like, that's cool, put in some more of that, like, tell me more about this thing. And my YA editor, often the response is, okay, okay, cut all this stuff, like, let's move faster, right? Because it's a different audience. Of the, the young adult audience generally um, is, it, it expects less of that detailed world building in its fiction than the adult science fiction or fantasy reader. So um, there's a, a scene um, in Crossfire where Donovan goes into the barracks where the Zri are staying, where they live in near the towers. And um, I had a whole scene where he goes in there and so you get to sort of see um, how the aliens live and, um, and, and like how the other, uh, how, how these three soldiers are kind of spending their time and he's kind of interacting with them and he's on his way to see his, um, see one of them, his commander. And so I had this whole thing, this cool bit of world building and my editor like cut it all out. Well, I mean, she basically made me speed it all up to like get from him entering the towers to him having that conversation and like, one paragraph instead of like the two pages that I had that had like all these cool details of how the aliens lived. And I was like, oh, but I thought this through. Mm -hmm. I don't understand, like I know how it's laid out and like this is how they like, where they eat and sleep and all this stuff. But uh, I had to leave it. We really need like, you know how in the end of DVDs they have like all the deleted scenes and extended things. We really right. need them in books, but then we'd have to edit them, so we're never going to do it. Put it on their website. Like, I kind of want to go to your website and read those two pages. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, unfortunately, it's not like a cohesive deleted scene that I can just like. It's more like I had to cut all this cool detail out. I actually oh, no. do keep some hidden scenes, uh, yeah. some deleted scenes on hidden pages on my website. So I have encoded links to these scenes hidden uh, on the hardcovers, on the hardcover books, and I've also got them. You can, you can find them online, but uh, for enterprising people who feel like decoding encode, encoded URLs, then they can find deleted scenes on my site. Um, as you do. Um, but I think the coolest piece of world building I've ever cut was a really good one to cut. So very early on, uh, when I first signed with my agent, I did an extensive revision with my agent, so before we'd gone out to publishers. And I had this part of the book where I explained, um, 
the origin of the virus, which I'm not going to go into, but I said that, so there's this response. So pe when people smell the infected, they get this bloodlust come over them because we know that the only way to get short-term immunity to this virus is to eat a mouthful of the flesh of an infected person. And so when you smell an infected person, you get into this bloodlust, which makes sense because you're trying to get immunity. And so I had this part in the book where I explained that we must have been exposed to the virus in prehistoric times for long enough for us to have evolved this response to the scent, this very unique scent. Um, and the first draft had a lot more about the scent and exploring this response. Um, but my agent said, eh, cut it. You know, it was, it was just beside the point. It wasn't very interesting. But in cutting that, I left open the question as to why we do have this response to the scent, why we do have this bloodlust um, overcome us. And I've got a much better, much better solution to that now <laughs> that we'll explore later in the series. In book so it, it, yeah, it ended up as something you could use yeah. as a trap door for yourself in yes. book three. Yes, <laughs> that's right. So that was useful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? All right. Well, thanks for coming. We are staying. We will sign books. And thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.